Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope the sound is uh, uh, pretty much okay. Um, so let me first introduce myself. Uh, who am I? Um, I am working at KBC, um, but not in uh, the typical uh, KBC bank and insurance business. I already working for six years in uh, a kind of sandbox environment. Uh, I always compare it with the book of Costa Peric, the castle and the sandbox, uh, meaning that I'm uh, full time busy working with external companies on innovation, uh, helping and enabling uh, entrepreneurs uh, making an innovation by putting an innovation on the market. Uh, so that's a little bit my background. Um, started at KBC for those who never heard about it. Eh? So we help startup founders from idea to sustainable business. Um, we, uh, we do this together with a couple of partners. We are a non-profit. Um, and yes, I, we have actually a, a complete program, um, a year-long program. Uh, this Monday, we uh, ended uh, an application round. So uh, within two weeks, we, do, we will have some pitch days. Um, so more than uh, 250 people applied uh, for the program. Uh, they will get a lot of insights, a lot of networking possibilities, but also a lot of um, knowledge on uh, setting up a startup. Um, so, yeah, for those who want to know more, you can check uh, always uh, our um, website. Um, voila. So, starting a business, uh, and I've put here, as unusual, uh, the first checklist for startups, because I will mainly speak about uh, startups and the difference between a normal business. Um, um, so, if I want to start a business in, in Belgium, um, and I would be in your place, for instance, the first thing probably a lot of people will do is go to Google and check on Google, like, okay, how can I start a business in Belgium? Um, and then a lot of uh, information will pop up um, and you will probably also be directed to the website of business.belgium.be uh, where you have like a, a, a complete guide on uh, what uh, you need to do to set up a business uh, in Belgium. How can you incorporate a company? What do you need to do for registration and so on? So everything is uh, on this website uh, in a kind of a guide. Um, you can even, um, there's a procedure guide eh, where you can put like, okay, where are you from, what do you do, in which sector, and so on. Uh, and then you get um, um, yeah, a filtered uh, guide on uh, what you should do. Depending on the region, you will start up your business. Eh, because uh, you, you know, uh, you all know Belgium is a, uh, is a complex country. Eh, so we have the Flemish, Flemish region, the Brussels capital region, the Walloon region, and they all have their own, um, their own, um, yeah, yeah um, people uh, that help entrepreneurs uh, by, by setting up a business. Um, so in Brussels, um, for those who have a business, probably will know 1819 Brussels. Uh, they are a kind of one-stop shop for uh, all information. Uh, to start up a business in Brussels, uh, including also to see uh, all the grant opportunities and all the procedures and, uh, and so on. Uh, you can also uh, contact them and they give you free advice and um, they help you further. The same in Flanders, for those who do this in Flanders, um, then you have uh, at Agentschap Innoveren en Ondernemen, uh, where they also have uh, all this information uh, and, uh, and give it uh, to the entrepreneurs, and of course the same in Wallonia. Um, so, uh, starting up a business, uh, apart from going to Google, uh, the, one of the first things a lot of people also will do or will need, yeah, because there's a lot of administration um, yeah, uh, involved, um, a good accountant and a, sometimes a business lawyer can help. Yeah? Um, so, make sure that um, if it's something complex and you don't understand everything, um, you, as of day one, you probably need an accountant, um, probably. Uh, so yeah, make sure that you find yourself a good one. Yeah. But if you go, uh, if you get in contact with them, they will always also uh, ask uh, and also other partners about your business plan. So did you already thought over uh, 
what type of business you want to start, um, what are your goals, and you already thought about your competitors, how you do your marketing, your finance strategy, and so on. Um, so, and I like Google and Wikipedia. And then if, if you search on uh, business plan, uh, you will read uh, this on Wikipedia, and where you can see um, it's a formal written document containing your business goals, etc. But in the final sentence, you see like business plans are often required to obtain a bank loan or other kind of financing. But also uh, a lot of people ask about your business plan. And I'm not telling here that everybody should make a business plan because you will find online a lot of reasons why not to write a business plan as of day one starting up a business uh, and we will go deeper uh, into this topic uh, during this web uh, during this uh, webinar uh, but on the same time you will also find uh, a lot of websites telling yeah even as a startup uh, working on an innovation you should write a business plan um, so it's not always uh, clear like, okay, do I need a business plan or not? Should I work on it or not? It's a, it's a yes, but eh, or a no, although. Um, so I hope this presentation uh, can help you. Um, but the most important stuff before going into a business plan and uh, uh, putting your um, your idea into a business plan, and you can also see this on the website of Belgium.be. Before you do this and take the necessary steps, you first need to ask yourself some questions. And actually, it comes down to two uh, crucial things. Um, the first of all is like, okay, what is the type of business you want to start? What's your business? What's your startup idea? And secondly, um, what about your timing? Is the timing right? Is it uh, the timing right to start now or should you wait? Uh, so these are two very crucial things. Uh, and uh, let's go into that um, first of all on your business. Um, and I always use this graph. Uh, what kind of business do you want to start? A lot depends on, depends on, yeah, what you want to do. So if you look at this graph and you think about it's the economy, so all the types of businesses that you see on the street in, uh, in Belgium, um, yeah, uh, you can put them like in a kind of graph like this, and then you will see that there are a lot of type of businesses are the same. So you have a lot of people that have a bakery, uh, or like having a, a kind of um, a freelancer in the, in the medical sector or a, a, another freelancer or a transportation company, whatever. And so this is like this big body of these dinosaurs. So a lot of people are doing this type of business. Uh, what you have to know is, first of all, um, the systems are made for this type of business because they are known. Okay? Uh, so if you start uh, riding this uh, company, you will see uh, normally that the road is clear. Uh, there's you can fuel, uh, so there are people that will help you, um, and yeah, you have to follow typically the whole checklists, the whole procedures that uh, on all these websites uh, of Belgium or Flanders or uh, 1819 Brussels uh, that you just need to uh, to do all the uh, procedures, and, and that normally it will work. Although uh, it's a lot of work, but and why is it? Because it's known business. Uh, and you will also uh, will be asked to put like, okay, what's your NASI bell code? Uh, your NASI code, uh, tell me like what type of uh, sector you're working on. Uh, and uh, are you a manufacturer of food products, uh, a bakery, for instance, and so on. And there are codes that you have to, uh, together with your accountant, you have to um, choose uh, and registered as uh, being the activities that you will do with your business. Uh, so this is for this big body. Uh, again, if they go to a bank, for instance, um, uh, then yeah, they will probably also uh, get a kind of credit or a loan if they can uh, show that they are uh, that they have this business plan. 
um, and that they are qualified for it. Because it's most of the time not so complex uh, to fund, right? because it's a well-known business, uh, the market is known, uh, and most of these businesses, like 90% of all the businesses in Belgium, are uh, funded like this. Eh? So own funds, it's always necessary to put some own funds in your business um, to give credibility. And, uh, but together with the bank loan, most of the businesses like uh, can start with this. Um, so if you start another business, uh, but it's in the long tail, I call it a business that's unusual, and then we are talking about uh, startups um, most of the time in general. Uh, these are like companies uh, building a business which is not known. So if they go, for instance, to an accountant and they will explain what they are doing, uh, it will be hard to put a NACIBEL code against the business. Uh, most of the time it will be like, uh, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, something with IT or, um, yeah, it's still sometimes unknown. Yeah? So, not clear. Um, again, going to Wikipedia, uh, and that's a big difference between starting a company and a starter, uh, like um, um, as somebody who starts a business. A normal business versus somebody who starts a startup business. In Wikipedia, they are defining it like uh, an entrepreneurial venture uh, on uh, working on a newly fast um, growing business. Um, so, an innovative product or process or service is involved, uh, and they have the ambition most of the time to make a scalable business out of it. And so, if you look at this graph there, you see a bakery, if I start a bakery, they call it on Wikipedia a kiosk. It's a market validated business model. Everybody knows what a bakery does. Uh, if a bakery goes to the bank for a loan, he, does need, he doesn't need to pitch his idea. Because the banker, the banker knows that he will sell bread and croissants and so on. Um, but most of the time, it's a low growth ambition um, or a non-scalable business, like a bakery, of, cor of course, it's, uh, it's limited in scale if you just open one bakery and of course you can franchise it and you make them scale it, then it goes more to the right, uh, to block B, but most of the uh, freelancer, it's also hard to scale because it's like very much depending on uh, yeah, your days and your days are, um, are um, scarce, and they are uh, ending. So most of the businesses are kiosks, a startup has other ambitions. Yeah? So they have, uh, um, they are uh, trying to put a, a big scalable business on the market, um, but the market is not validated yet. And the business model is also not validated yet. So this is a big difference yeah? because they have to start somewhere else. Um, you can see uh, this is an example of our website, yeah? but um, the, yeah, there are a lot of, like, I think yearly around of, uh, around 500 to 600 uh, new startups in Belgium, but of course also a lot of startups um, stop early stage uh, because their business was not validated. So there are a lot of failures also, um, but in all kinds of sectors. Uh, so on our website you can see examples of startups. Um, this is one of Brussels, um, which is in our community. Um, uh, that are putting software on the market uh, for uh, relocations uh, for expats, uh, just as an example here. Another example, uh, so this is a more traditional product, although it's innovative and scalable, and it was a startup at that time, Richie Lemonade, so you could think like, yeah, lemonade, it's a normal product, of course, yeah, but not a lot of people are putting lemonade on the market in Belgium. It's not the same as a bakery, uh, and also the ones that try, uh, a lot of them do not succeed. So, but it's scalable. Once you have like uh, put it on the market, uh, and you grow, you can grow volume. It's scalable, uh, and it's innovative in this type. Uh, like Richie, in um, like for those who know uh, Richie, um, it's uh, Belgium-made lemonade. There's less uh, sugar in it. It's a luxury product, so it's a high-end product. Uh, that's why they also put it like in a special bottle. Um, 
Um, yeah, so this makes it innovative because in Belgium you don't see a lot of Belgian lemonades uh, and not of this quality also. So some examples eh, and um, we, are, we are seeing that the number of startups is growing year after year and now also the last application round that we ended this Monday we have records, a record of, of startup applications. Um, so it's still growing. And because more and more people are dreaming about starting up their business. Um, and yeah, if they go on the market and they start uh, talking with people uh, compared with this bakery, their road is not so clear. Uh, you don't see a fuel station here. Uh, it's not a paved wave, uh, way, uh, so it's, uh, it's very hobbly. Uh, you already see uh, yep, some uh, some signs like yeah uh, it will end uh, soon um, I, I just want to compare it with uh, like if you start a startup uh, and you start speaking with people uh, yeah you will get a lot of questions and you will uh, also uh, yeah it will be difficult uh, sometimes to pursue people uh, about your startup yeah, about your startup idea and to sell your new product so it's a it's a more difficult road than a known business. So a big difference difference between business as usual and business as unusual. If they go to a bank as of day one, yeah, because like most of the entrepreneurs do yeah, know the system, yeah, it will be hard to get a loan application in the beginning yeah, if you don't have like a validated market yet. Yeah, because banks know that um, a lot of startups end in the valley of debt. Uh, it's not, uh, the value is not in the idea, but uh, the value is in the launch and in the growth and the maturity. But you first need to do a lot of investments uh, of time uh, to, to see that it's feasible to develop the product and so on. So that's why uh, there's a huge value of that um, that we see on the market. Um, and that's why also startups um, will not have this easy way of funding uh, with own funds and bank funding, but they will first of all do a lot of bootstrapping, meaning doing a lot of uh, a lot of work yourself, uh, a lot of uh, using a lot of free stuff available, um, making for, uh, your own logo in the beginning, making your own disclaimers and so on, not going to a, a lawyer as of day one. Uh, so, um, using free software, um, getting a side job um, together with the startup idea to, to have still some revenue in, uh, uh, to live from. Uh, going to the friends, families and fools, uh, going for grants, looking for grants, uh, crowdfunding, venture capital. So, it's a much more complex way of building a funding uh, mix. And you build it up, uh, meaning that you also uh, get more trust. And um, how do you start building up your business? Uh, so because it's what, it, uh, then uh, a lot of um, companies use the business model canvas. Um, it's just a method, uh, so it's not a purpose, it's just a tool that can help you to clear out uh, your idea uh, that you have as a startup. Um, it contains of the nine building blocks of, of a company. Uh, and um, in the end, finally, it will end up in a business plan and this type of blocks will also be in your business plan. Yeah. So it begins with yeah, what uh, who will be your customers, yeah. so um, who, who is your customer segment, who do you want to serve with your product or your service, yeah. what types of jobs they want to get done and what's your offer to them. What is the product, the service uh, that you uh, deliver to them? Value proposition is one of the most difficult parts uh, to get validated uh, as a startup. A value proposition, it's the promise of value that you deliver to be delivered, communicated um, towards your customer. Yeah, so if you go into depth about it um, and if you uh, work further on the business model canvas, you will see if you start Googling that there's also the value proposition canvas to go into detail on your value proposition. Yes. So first on the right, you have to empathize with your customers' problems like, okay, ask, see why, what type of problems they have and how, uh, yeah, what 
jobs to be done. They need what are the pains and the gains. And then you try to match your value proposition, your product, your service, that, uh, and how it can solve their pains or create gains for them. Uh, but then it's going. We will not go into details here because it's a it's a, a webinar on its own. Uh, but yeah, how do you create value typically by increasing revenue of the customer, decreasing their costs, decreasing the risks, or gi put, uh, giving them more convenience? These are like the four main types of value. Um, of course, you can go into details much more. You will see here the pyramid of uh, value. Uh, coming from Bain and Company with a lot of stuff that you can uh, probably recognize if you start a building a, a business uh, what types of these blocks what what circles uh, of value that uh, your business uh, brings to your customers but most of the time again it's an increase of revenue decrease of costs or risks or putting more convenient in the market if you want to know more about this i can recommend you to go to the three uh, one and a half uh, our webinar of uh, uh, GrowForce, um, where they completely uh, go into details of this value proposition. Then the third block in the business model canvas is your channel. Like how does your customer segment want to be reached then? How do you market them? How do you reach them? Uh, how do you communicate to, towards them? And uh, fourthly, like what's that? Do you have a kind of relationship uh, with them? A direct, indirect? Um, how do you retain them? Uh, and then based on those four blocks, what's the revenue? So what uh, kind of revenue model uh, linked to this product um, you get uh, or you are aiming to get? And then on the left, uh, what resources do you need uh, to, put, to put your value proposition towards customers? And most of the time it's like FTE people. Or some machines, yeah, if, if I put a bakery on the market, I need an, an oven, uh, a bakery oven to bake uh, my bread. Yeah. Um, so what resources you need, what activities do you need to perform? Uh, yeah, baking bread, um, uh, yeah, making, and, uh, making software, uh, um, keeping, up, keeping the software up to date, uh, market the software. Uh, it can be all these type of activities which partners and suppliers uh, you need uh, to get this business, uh, this value proposition uh, towards your customers. And so you should not do everything yourself. Uh, a lot of uh, people work with partners. And of course, then the last block, uh, all these resources, these activities you do, the partners you have, it will cost money. So what are the costs related to putting the whole business model in the market? So these are like, yeah, the nine building blocks of uh, the business model canvas, uh, which we recommend. Uh, you can freely uh, download it online, everywhere, worldwide, it's being used. Um, so it's one language, so everybody understands these this terms uh, it, once you start building a business plan. Um, again, uh, it's all about value. Uh, so these blocks are how do you create value, how do you deliver your value and how do you capture a part of the value? Okay, so this is the financial plan. So these are like the three uh, building blocks of the business model. Companies. A lot of people are using this, not only startups uh, or entrepreneurs, also big corporates, uh, most of the time to put a new business on the market. Um, so you can compare it. Uh, if you build a house and you go to uh, uh, an architect, uh, he will first make a couple of sketches uh, and the sketch uh, it will uh, differ over time the next step or during a couple of weeks you will discuss the, the sketches and you will make some changes and when everything is fine and you tell like okay, this is the house that we want then only then the architect will start um, calculating the whole detailed um, plans and eh? how uh, to, to build the house uh, so this is the same with building a business. So the business model canvas, you can compare it with the sketch, a business plan. This is when your sketch is finalized, validated, and you know uh, what to do. The good part of a business model canvas is also that you can put it in the context and you can relate it towards key trends like um, technology, regulation, and so on. These are all key trends that are having a uh, 
uh, yeah, have, that, that are um, uh, affecting your business model. Eh? Imagine that your business model was like um, uh, um, an agency uh, for a vacation uh, agency, a travel agency. Uh, like 20 years ago, you had them on each, each uh, street, but then the internet came uh, and more and more people started uh, booking their uh, holidays online. Eh? So it's a technology that forced a lot of these, these travel agencies to change their business model and also to go online and to have less shops and to have more an online proposal and so on. The same with market forces, like what are the customers and what do customers want and customers are changing, everybody knows. And again, also here, and the whole macroeconomic forces are also very important. And the, the whole COVID crisis now is one huge uh, macroeconomic force on a lot of businesses. And you see that a lot of businesses had to reinvent themselves uh, or got into troubles uh, because, uh, because of the COVID. And then on the left, you have industry. Uh, so competition uh, and suppliers and so on also have an impact on uh, your business. And so that's the good part of business model cameras that you can always do this. And just as an example, everybody knows Nespresso. Uh, this is how it looks like uh, when they probably first started the idea of Espresso. So they've put a value proposition there with, uh, with post-its, uh, the customer segments and so on. So they filled it in. So but let's not go into depth about it. So that's the first checklist. Eh? So the first thing, your business, put it on paper and don't make a huge business plan if you're a startup. Uh, if you're a normal business, you can make a business plan. But if you're a startup, use the business model canvas uh, because it's your first sketch. Because secondly, and that's timing is um, is yeah at least um, as important as your business. Um, so this is related to how validated your business model is. Do you have some proof? that somebody is waiting for your product or service or your startup. And again, making the link, what kind of business do you want to start? Uh, if you're there in this big uh, um, dinosaur's uh, body, eh, imagine eh, the example of the bakery. Of course, a bakery, everybody knows, so it's validated. Check. Or if you are qualified to start a bakery, eh, you know how to bake bread or you have somebody uh, that you can hire uh, that is a baker, uh, then you are qualified. And um, if you made your business plan uh, and people trust you, uh, yeah, then you have a validated business. You can actually start right away. Um, and that's what they call, uh, and we will go deeper in it, you have product market fit. So as of day one, starting this, this bakery, uh, it means you have product market fit, your product, Bread, croissants have a fit with the market because people eat daily uh, some bread. Oh, easy. So the timing is there to start your business uh, if you're qualified and so on. So you just need to uh, maybe go to 1819 Brussels, uh, go to a bank, uh, and you can start. Uh, you have to check uh, the whole checklist um, uh, to register the company and so on, and you can start uh, very uh, quickly. Normally. But again, this startup, um, and talking about this uh, definition, and now I will put some other definitions there, uh, because here they are talking about an entrepreneurial venture, a venture meaning uh, a, a company, but actually the real definition coming from the lean startup uh, and the startup way, and two books of Eric Rice, who is like the, um, uh, the, 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 the guy that um, came with the lean startup uh, methodology, which we will go into deep in, into depth now. Uh, there, it is like Steve Blank uh, defined a startup is a temporary organization. So it's very important to see the difference eh, between a bakery. So here, temporary organization. So it should not be yet a company. Eh? A lot of the startups that we see entering startup at KBC do not have yet a company number and registra registration and so on, because they are still in the ideation phase and they are looking, searching for a repeatable, scalable business model. 
A second definition uh, Eric Rice put on the market, eh, a human institution. So again, eh, so me together with one of you can be a human institution designed to deliver a new product or service under conditions of extreme uncertainty. Putting Richie on the market, it went with a lot of uncertainty because he, Jan Verlinde, who put it on the market, he didn't know that it would succeed to put uh, this new type of Belgian-made uh, lash sugar lemonade on the market uh, at, at a high-end price, because otherwise it's not uh, a viable business model. Okay. So that's what startups, uh, I, that's what, how startups differ from other entrepreneurs. Uh, they master the skills of value creation and capturing. Uh, so an idea is worth nothing. If you have an idea of a startup, it's worth nothing. It only gets uh, valuable if you see that you can create value for some customers. Yeah, so if you see that you create value and that customers are interested, that you solve a problem or you, you give some gains, yeah, then you can start building your company. Um, and that's the building phase. But again, then, even then, you're not sure that you will make it as a company because you, you should also be able to capture a part of the value and to get money for it. So uh, a lot of startups have an idea. If they uh, ask people do, that they like it and that they would use it, they will tell, yes, we would use it. For instance, uh, Facebook, yeah, we like to use it, of course, but do you want to pay for it? No, we don't want to pay for it. So you don't have, you don't have, uh, you, you don't capture your value. And that's why eh, they uh, rethought about their business model. And then, yeah, if we use an advertising model in Facebook, then other companies uh, will advertise and that will make uh, um, yeah, our revenue streams. And then we can go to market, you see. So you first need to search where you can get money out of it. And it's not always coming from your customers. The, the example of Facebook, the, um, yeah, the money doesn't come from the users. It comes from uh, companies. Um, then you can think about the go-to-market, uh, and then you probably see a lot of uh, news uh, in the news, like uh, a startup that does the funding round and gets a lot of uh, like a VC rounds, uh, a couple of millions. Then you can scale. So the first two blocks is the search of a business. The other two blocks is the growth of a business. And the first two blocks, from going from zero to one, Startups, they do this bootstrapping because most of them, they don't have money. They don't have a lot of money to put into the, into the, uh, the search phase. Uh, and they will also not get it in that phase because the uh, validation is not there. Uh, it's too uncertain. Um, so a lot of them bootstrap or get some business angels on board um, who believe in the, in the team. If you have product market fit, then you start cash burning and you go from one to n so then you're scaling uh, then you can set up the whole company and go into the procedure again so every startup is looking for product market fit okay? a working business model and customers that want to pay for it if you don't have product market fit you shouldn't start scaling so if you start scaling too soon as a startup you will probably end in the value of that um, Lean startup, how does it work? Um, and yeah, Eric Rice, he came with the loop. It's an iterative, uh, continuous learning process. And so build, measure, learn. Maybe some people already heard about it. And so first you build an experiment. Uh, you want to learn something. Yeah? You want to validate your idea. So you have an hypothesis. You build an experiment uh, to check if the hypothesis is true. You measure, you have some metrics there, and then you have to pivot or you have to change or you validate your hypothesis and you can do it as much as you need it. And that's the build, measure, learn loop. Uh, we will make it concrete right away with some examples, uh, experiments. Uh, Richie, going back to this example, uh, putting um, yeah, uh, a refreshing soft drink on the market uh, with special... Uh, juices eh, and it's uh, special uh, flavors uh, less sugar made in belgium and premium 
He did not start it right away, uh, going to big uh, horecas, uh, going to the big shops and so on. No, he started on a couple of markets, a couple of festivals where you have early adopters to get some insights uh, in this product. And guess what? Uh, he learned by going with a, at a low budget uh, to this type of stuff. What do you learn? Um, maybe some thoughts eh? uh, we can go through it together it's i think a little bit too um, too complex to do it here now eh? but what did he learn yeah he got a lot of feedback on flavors eh? so people will would have told him like okay we only like this flavor the other one is not so good so we get some insights there he also got uh, some tests on pricing elasticity because in, in, in one market he probably sold his riches for two euros and another one for three euro, euros. Um, so he learned that you can ask a higher price than a normal Coca-Cola or something uh, than standard lemonades. He also learned that people are interested in local products. A made in Belgium label would probably market the lemonade better. He also found out that less sugar is something which people are looking for because in Fanta, Cola, Pepsi and so on there's still a lot of sugar in. Um, and he was being contacted right away by restaurants and bars, bars to ask like okay can we put this uh, on our uh, menu part because we really like this product uh, and uh, a lot of customers are asking for something else than the typical standard lemonades. Okay, so you see a lot of tests, a lot of experiments just by going out uh, low budget bootstrapping uh, to learn about your product about uh, your business another example is a, a startup from Leuven, Colby company uh, they came to the market with um, an automated um, gardening machine uh, to um, yeah, um, to uh, blow snow in your garden in the, during winter um, to uh, mulch the leaves and to um, to mark the, the grass. So it has three functionalities. This was their website, but they just, uh, they were a startup, they built a prototype, which is working, partly working for the snowblower, but they, not, they never built the other two uh, applications. Uh, they, uh, they built an explainer movie uh, where they put their idea on uh, and it looked like they already had everything, uh, if you look at this. And they just went to the biggest expo in the US uh, with this, um, with this um, product. So they also uh, released a press release uh, and they got a lot of press coverage. Uh, they went to CNN, Forbes, Bloomberg and so on. So a lot of uh, press coverage, uh, you see some examples here. Um, so guess uh, um, if, uh, if they got a lot of press coverage, a lot of people went to the website. Of course, and then they pushed the button. I want a Kobe because they want to more uh, to know more. And then they came onto some pages like, okay, what tasks you need for your Kobe? Yeah, do you are are you interested in the law application, the snow or the leaf application? How big is your law? Um, where do you live? Uh, which country? What's your name and so on? Uh, and then of course they get a message like, uh, we are not yet available. Yeah, so, but based on this, what do you think they learned? They learned really a lot. It's like a market study, but it's for free. Yeah, so, they got a lot of interest, and, and they, they, especially from professional gardeners, yeah, they thought that they were disrupting the professional gardeners because with this type of machine, uh, yeah, you take away uh, work from them. But they found out that, especially those gardeners. Especially the gardeners um, are interested in this machine. So they pivoted from B2C to B2B after uh, all the insights they got. They also got some insight in pricing elasticity. And so in this survey, they also uh, told, like, okay, you want to have a law application and a snow application? Well, this will cost you $3,999 by now. And then uh, you push the button, it looked like a web shop but it was not a web shop and then you got the message sorry we are not ready yet uh, we will leave you a message once we are ready and so they learn about price uh, so it's a huge market study they did they also uh, find out which regions in the us yeah, because they are based uh, they are uh, focusing on the us um, 
which regions have the biggest needs, what type of needs. Yeah, they saw that a lot of uh, golf clubs and other sport clubs are especially interested in the law uh, application. They got interest from big investors and got their insights. So they talked with all the big VCs in the US. Uh, they were also contacted by their competitors. They thought they were uh, competing with John Deere and all the big uh, uh, gardening uh, manufacturers on the, uh, in the world. But they contacted them to partner up because they were interested in how they made this product and if they can uh, help them out because they were never able uh, yet to make their product like this. So they find out that there might be a profitable business to just bring the technology on the market and not the whole product, because then you need a lot of investment. Right? You need to put up a factory, you need to put up a distribution and so on. And this is what Kobe is now. Right? So they completely pivoted away based on all their learnings. Uh, so they are completely B2B. They don't sell products uh, to, to consumers and consumers. They sell uh, autonomy to uh, gardening manufacturers and other manufacturers um, and to make, uh, to make it uh, autonomous. And this is an example. Eh? So one of their customers is Mean Green, which is, which is a gardening manufacturer, but you see it's navigated by Kobe. So they just put their technology there to make it self-driving, to make it safe, to make it accurate and so on. A much stronger business model. So you can imagine uh, the Kobe, the Ritchie, uh, this is how it starts. Eh? So they are very happy uh, when they start their startup. They are in enthusiasm, but the reality sets in. They learn a lot by experimenting and they will see that it's not so easy as they thought. And they will learn and they will pivot and so on. And, but once they have product market fit and they start scaling, uh, they went through the value of that. Eh? But again, a lot of startups and because they don't find product market fit, because they have team issues, because they don't pivot, they don't uh, um, listen uh, to the market, they don't test uh, their go to markets, and they are not keeping focus. So how do you do this as a startup? Uh, it's not about your idea of about building a business plan together. No, it's about action. So you need a dedicated team. Uh, that's why a startup is, it's not a good idea to start a startup, something innovative with one person. You need a dedicated team. Uh, you, you can use a bunch of tools and you need a lot of discipline. And you favor experimentation over elaborate planning. So it's another way of doing business than a normal business. And this is a little bit the whole process. It's not a linear one. Yeah. You start with uh, looping forward, the build, measure, learn, um, loop um, that uh, the, the Lean Startup methodology brings. And we, the first step uh, is there, your business model. And so understand your customer problem, your value proposition, design your business model canvas, that's the first step. But again, then you have your business model canvas filled in. It's like a pig, but if you put lipstick on it, it's still a pig. So your business model might look good on paper, but you have a lot of guess, guesses, a lot of assumptions and risks in your business model canvas. So then you have to start doing. As of day one, choose the most critical risks. How do you do it? You have your business model canvas, you put an X like this. This is known based on market study and so on, known on the market. And this is, we believe, an assumption and you put the assumptions on the right. And then secondly, uh, you put a vertical axis, what's essential to uh, get my business done and what's not essential. And then you get this and in the right uh, corner, upper corner, these are your leap of faith assumptions. These are the most important ones. If you don't test those in experiments and you don't get these validated, then you, it's a super high risk and uh, it will be very hard to validate your startup. So you have to think about tests to validate these assumptions. That's step, step three. So what's the smallest, the quickest thing you can create to test this assumption? And that's an experiment. Or, uh, they call it in the Lean Startup a minimal viable product, but it's not about the product. And most of the startups, they don't have a working product yet. Think about the Kobe, he didn't have a working uh, product yet. Um, a prototype is still a throwaway experimentation tool. So it can be a website, it can be 
uh, a mock-up and so on, but it's still something you probably throw away if you validate your business. So I don't like the word MVP. I think riskiest assumption test, RED, is a much better word uh, than an MVP because uh, MVP product is in there and a lot of people think they have to build their product first, which is not true. So I like it uh, more the RED. And then what do you do uh, based on your most riskiest uh, assumptions? Uh, sell it, make it, fake it until you make it. Watch them, uh, your potential customers, ask them compare it and you should not be embarrassed with your first prototype or product or website or whatever you launch as an experiment because if uh, you're not embarrassed you probably launched too late so you can brainstorm on what types of experiments you can build you can use um, a test card for this like we believe that and then you, you put your hypothesis there to verify that, we will do, and this is the test, eh? think about uh, Richie, uh, go to uh, some festivals and test these, these, these flavors, test. We will measure how much we, uh, we sold there and how much flavors, different flavors we sold, which are the best and so on. And we are right if, eh? you see, so you, you define upfront what you want to test, then you just do it. So you put like a, a agile scrum way of working uh, these are the experiments we are doing, we have done. Um, and then you check, what did you learn? Yeah, so we believed that uh, by going to this expo with a uh, Kobe company, uh, that we can uh, sell this product B2C and that there's a lot of um, uh, market for it. We observed yeah, that there's more, um, yeah, that it's more B2B from that we learned, blah, blah, blah. So you can put it like this uh, and like this, you, you are putting together your business model, your business plan by doing so and by learning. And sometimes you have to go back to the drawing table and adapt because some assumptions will not be validated and then you have to pivot. So this is a way, a tool that can help you to do this. Uh, we will not go into depth. So, and this is also like an overview of the process, but I just want to give away some key takeaways here. Uh, if you start a startup, First of all, your ideas were nothing, so you need to build a business model, capture value, uh, and test it. It takes, it takes time to discover a business model. As a bakery, it does not take a lot of time, but with a startup, it will take time. Uh, learning and experimentation is key. Focus on your customers and their needs and not on your products uh, and your uh, genius uh, uh, brains. Uh, uh, but think about your market, eh? go out and test the market as soon as possible, because by doing so, at all times, you manage your downside risk, because this is purely uh, de-risking your business. So bootstrapping is the way forward. And once it's validated, you go from startup to scale up. Eh? And looking at uh, Richie, they had a very difficult time to put this thing on the market. Uh, they were, it's an alumni that started, uh, but yeah, now they have product market fit. Eh? So, and you also see it on the website, eh? so you can uh, buy them like on almost every street uh, and every uh, shop in every city. Uh, you can, eat, they can already have budget uh, to go, uh, hey, to put some, um, um, some fishes on the market. Um, and soon actually they will be on television also. Uh, and uh, in June uh, this year, Jan uh, bought his own um, store, uh, his, his own uh, fabric for the first time. And so you see, it took him like a couple of years to validate his business. So key takeaways of this uh, checklist, two crucial things before even putting a business plan together. What's your business? Think about it. Uh, put it in a business model canvas and go to market and then timing, check if it's validated. So this is the whole process of going from ideation to, pro to problem solution fit, product market fit and scale. Uh, and to compare it, eh, Richie, they started left. Eh? They had the idea, but they had to overwin the value creation that there is a problem solution fit. They had to overwin that they can capture a higher price because otherwise it's not viable to put this on the market because they don't have the economies of scale as a big player like Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Uh, and uh, the bakery, he starts 
right away are product market fit because it's a well-known business. So it's a big difference between a startup and a well-known business. Once you have product market fit, there's a lot of stuff online where they help you with the rest of the checklist, how to register and so on. Uh, in Brussels, 1819, through a bank. So I hope this was uh, clear. So. Uh